Okay, everyone. Um, we're at 736, so we're going to get the program started. We have about half of the audience, and mm -hmm. I'll admit them as the program unfolds. My name is Jackie Cavalier. I am a proud member of the Battle Homestead Foundation, Board of Directors, and the Program Committee, uh, the members of which um, certainly worked very, very uh, uh, diligently to pull this program together. So we're so happy that y'all can join us today. Um, we will be taking questions for the Q&A portion of the program in the chat. So you can just post your questions in the chat. If you have very specific interests, um, issues or concerns, you can also send them individually to Nathan Ruggles, who will be moderating um, or monitoring the chat uh, as well. Otherwise, just feel free to post them uh, to everyone in the chat and we'll pull them off. Um, without further ado, I'm so happy to introduce our president of the Battle Homestead Foundation, John Hare. John, you're on. Thank you, Jackie. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Battle of Homestead Foundation's 2020 online program series. We're excited to have friends joining us from the Pittsburgh area, but also from Cleveland, Ithaca, Buffalo, Harrisburg, and many other places. I'm pleased to acknowledge the organizations that help make the production and distribution of American Factory possible. Higher Ground, that's Barack and Michelle Obama's production company. Participant Media, who's, who sponsored a wonderful uh, dinner and showing of the movie here last November. And Netflix, thank you. Tonight we have a sterling panel. We're fortunate that Julia, Julia Reichert and Stephen Bogner made time on their busy schedule to be with us. <clears throat> they are the second Academy Award winners to appear in our programs. Actor Mark Rylance was the first in 2017. Julia, however, is the first and only to exhort workers of the world unite upon receiving her Oscar. <laughs> Audience, I hope you reviewed the panel biographies in the last email. Uh, Julia and Stephen's incredible portfolio of movies and worldwide recognition make them seminal storytellers of working class life in America. Also, we have international development expert, Pitt professor Lou Picard. Lou's no stranger to movies. Together with his wife, Pauline Greenlick, they have documented the struggles and accomplishments of remarkable grassroots leaders in Uganda. Our third panelist is the irrepressible Braddock-born filmmaker, Tony Buba. Yes. Tony's films starkly portray the rise and the fall of our steel towns and the consequences, tragic and poignant, for the workers and townspeople. Our moderator is retired union leader, Rosemary Trump. No, no relation. Rosemary was chief organizer in the 70s for the new Pennsylvania Public Worker Unions. She served as president of SEIU 585 and as a VP on the SEIU International Executive Board, the first woman such SEIU VP ever. Let me briefly tell you about the Battle of Homestead Foundation. In 1992, after the capitalists had shut our mills and devastated our communities, a band of activists, steel workers and other unionists, academics, artists, organizers, convened a conference to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Homestead. Later in 1997, we incorporated in order to produce educational and cultural events. Last year's events highlights included a searing forum on family separation at the border, a powerful summit with local labor and environmental leaders, an un unforgettable commemoration hosted by the Brackenridge ATI steelworkers honoring the martyrdom of labor heroine Fanny Sellens, and several films and song fests. This year, like everyone, our plans were drastically changed by COVID-19. Digital meetings and physical distance outreach is the new reality. Today's workers and unions and our imperfect democracy are facing unprecedented challenges. How can we continue to spotlight the lives and hopes of the vast majority of people? Those who do the work, raise the families, fight the wars and sacrifice for a better future. How? We'll retool and adapt and continue organizing. 
Tonight's our first program for 2020, There's More. Check our website about upcoming programs in June and July. Also coming soon, podcasts. Our mission remains inspired by the dramatic labor conflict of the 1892 Battle of Homestead. We promote a people's history, empower today's workforce, and build strategies for the future of work. What better occasion for these purposes than tonight? We have seen this amazing movie. It revealed vivid and compelling events with complex and harsh realities about working in the USA. How do we respond? Let's talk about that tonight. The most amazing thing to me is how many actual pivotal events appear on screen in this movie. The access of the filmmakers to history at work is remarkable. When the last frame flickered, I was both spent and enlightened. I learned more than I ever could have from daily media accounts. I glimpsed the heavy lifting we all have to bear to win a better world for working families and our communities. So now I'm pleased to present our moderator, Rosemary Trump. Oh, mute, mute. All right. I'd let me start over. It's really exciting to have all of you here. You're all making history as uh, we appear and speak and participate in this event. It's the very first uh, program virtually that the Battle of Homestead has uh, put on. Uh, the, you know, the Pump House has been our normal uh, venue. And uh, you know, I'm so very, very pleased that uh, we have so many participating and, uh, and I know this is gonna be an exciting kickoff program of several programs that the Battle of Homestead is gonna be putting on this, this summer. So, uh, but, you know, first I'm gonna ask uh, Julia Reichert and Steve Bogner to spend a little time uh, talking about, you know, the making of their film and uh, any, anything you really wanna talk about uh, because we do have a chat room for people to ask questions about and I will be, uh, receiving those questions to direct them to the, whichever panelists, whether it's Steve or Julia or, or, or Lou or Tony. And uh, so it's gonna be a lovely evening, a lovely discussion, and uh, I'm inviting all of you to participate. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Julia, thanks so much. I, we have a, you know, I, I just, uh, you know, we have a, a, a special friend that we shared, uh, Karen Nussbaum. I was on er, a Zoom program earlier with her with Working America. She and oh. uh, yes, uh, just this afternoon at two o'clock, and and uh, we go back many years. And and I know I'm so excited about the fact that uh, that you're going to be doing, uh, you know, that you're soon to release, or maybe you have released uh, Nine to Five, the story of. Uh, uh, of a movement and uh, starring uh, Karen and uh, many of the people that we do in SEIU and we're looking forward to it. So maybe you could even tell us, you know, give us a plug about your new upcoming uh, film and it's probably gonna be another uh, Oscar winner as well. Well, I don't know about that, but anyway, <laughs> this is so cool looking at everybody's faces. This is really amazing. And it's wonderful to meet you, Rosemary. You're a legend. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. you know. <laughs> Actually, my daughter used to work at SEIU. Ah. Um, yeah, she was an organizer, but then she became a, a lawyer, and she worked at the SEIU headquarters in DuPont Circle. Yay! In the there. Anyway, uh, chip off, well, she's more than a chip off the old block. She's starting a whole new block. Uh -huh. um, yeah, nine to five. Um, this is really cool. We're, we, you know, before we started to make American Factory, like years, a few years before, and then since we finished, uh, we've been working on this film about, it's like a birth of a movement story, and you all know about the working women's movement, the secretary's movement that started in the 70s and continued on into the 80s and 90s. Uh, well, we made a film about it, and it, most people don't realize that the song, 9 to 5, right, work in 9 to 5, that song, and the movie came out of that movement. And in fact, a lot of it was given birth in Cleveland, uh, and all that comes out in, uh, in our film. And we wanted, I mean, it's an oral history film, kind of like Seeing Red or Union Maids. You know, we go, it's history from the bottom up. You know, there are the leaders. I mean, Ellen Cassidy and Karen Nussbaum are in the film, but in general, it's more people from who became active um, 
because of their contact with the organization. Yeah, and so we were telling that story. And one of the, I always say like when we made Seeing Red, which maybe a lot of you have seen, we were, I was like a young person talking to older people and trying to sit at their feet and kind of understand what they did and what they went through as people in the Communist Party, right? This time, I'm of the age of the people in the film. And um, I think this time around, I very much wanted this film to be, and I think Steve agreed, to be almost like partly a letter to younger organizers, right? To sort of let them know what, what they can learn from an earlier movement. You know, the, the, the successes, the failures, the things they tried, uh, their tactics, you know, when, when they made big decisions uh, and the ways in which the, the, the culture kind of crashed down on them, particularly in the Reagan years. Uh, and with the rise of the anti-ERA and the, the Christian right and all that. So all that, is, all that is in the story. And I wanted it to be very much for younger organizers, uh, as well as being a fun, a, a film that's fun and cool to watch. So I'm very excited. It's going to... Um, it, it was supposed to premiere at South by Southwest yeah. this past March. And then of course, that festival and like every festival got canceled. So we're, we're re-looking at how we're going to launch the film in this new era where there are no movie theaters. Uh, and it looks like pretty soon we'll be able to announce that it'll have a premiere at a big online festival, a big festival that's going to be online this year, yeah. uh, sometime, you know, this summer. This summer, yeah. And it's, well, we it's really appreciate be yeah, you giving us a preview of it, and we're looking forward to it. And, and when it comes out, perhaps you'll, we could do another Zoom meeting. But uh, I wonder if you want to comment about uh, the American uh, factory and how it began and, uh, you know, and uh, sure. sort of give us the background of it as well. Thank well, you. you know, a lot of people know we live in Dayton, Ohio. We've lived here for 30 years now, probably. And many of you might have seen an earlier film we made called The Last Truck, Closing of the General Motors Plant. That film gave, was directly what gave rise to American Factory, you know, like, like a lot of things in 08, and I'm sure Tony knows about this even from before, you know, our big GM plant closed and people's lives were really devastated, all the loss of those good union jobs. Uh, and we covered that, we followed it for all that, that, that time. Yeah, that film came out in 2009 and it's a 40 minute short, all told from the point of view of the folks who work the assembly lines. So we didn't include management perspectives, uh, there were a lot of efforts to save the plant by the city. We didn't include those uh, perspectives. There's no GM. It's, it it has a very narrow yeah. point of view. And but, but big point of view, actually. It's a point of view of just the workers. But a lot, a lot of workers, but that specific point of view. And when we started making American Factory 10 years later, you know, here's this dead factory that's mm -hmm. suddenly bought by a Chinese billionaire. It's going to come back to life. Jobs are going to come back to Dayton, Ohio. Right. There's so much excitement. And when we started, we thought we'd be telling another story from the perspective of American blue collar workers. Yeah, we did. It, you know, as you met, most of you have seen the film, I guess, you know, um, and it really is a much more Shakespearean, like big, big story than we, in a way we've ever told before. Uh, and I felt like pretty early on we realized we had to we had to tell we had to represent the perspective of the management of the hr people of the owner who was a chinese guy as you all know so it was to, I, to me there were moments i felt like well i'm totally on the other side of the barricades than i have ever been in my life right but i think that was the right thing to do because everybody was trying to do something really hard uh, that is create this plant from scratch from an old building and get Chinese blue collar workers and American blue collar workers to culturally kind of somehow come together and work together. That was going to be a huge effort. And so we really wanted to tell it from all the different perspectives. Little did we know that there was going to be a huge union battle. Little did we know that China and the U.S. were going to 
have a huge battle. Little did we know that um, we were making a film about globalization. I mean, we thought we were making a film about, you know, blue collar workers in the next chapter sort of in Dayton, Ohio. We, we started filming in February, 2015, <laughs> and it ramped up pretty quickly. And then of course yeah. we filmed all through 2016 and 2017. And we filmed the election, you know, Ohio drew a lot of the energy of the 2016 election. We filmed a ton of events around that, uh, which none of which are in the film, because by the time we were editing in 2018, it really felt like old news uh, that, you know, who we all know who won and all that stuff. But um, we finished the union battle. The vote happened in November, 2017. And we, we just felt like in a kind of organic way, the main plot of the movie that culminates in this union vote had happened. And so we finished, we wrapped up filming in December, 2017. So we had filmed for about three years and we had over 1200 hours of footage, a, a really huge wow. amount of footage, uh, more, more than double what we'd ever filmed for any documentary before. And we had built a team. It wasn't just Julia and I. No. Uh, we had an amazing, great team who filmed with us. Often, you know, there'd be three, four, five of us in the factory, in different places in the factory, following different people, uh, all in pursuit of this large story from multiple points of view. Uh, it was super intense. It was like an insanely intense three years of filming. And, you know, you, you guys met some of the people from Participant Media. Yes. And maybe Higher Ground. I don't know if they were there at the Pittsburgh event that we had. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there. But, you know, I was under pretty intense cancer treatment uh, at that point. So I was just totally unable to travel, which was really sad for me. But, you know, the film, you probably noticed, has Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. Uh, you know, act one, we see is like the honeymoon. You know, everyone's curious, everyone's hopeful, everyone's gonna get behind this. Everyone's gonna, you know, work for the, the effort. And then the shit hits the fan, like safety, uh, heat, uh, lack of respect, speed up, all these things start happening. And then the uh, culmination of it all was the, was it, it all came to a head sort of in the union battle. Yeah. And that's where you see what I personally think is the most revelatory part of the movie for many audiences. And we always speak about it when we go out on the road with the film, which is the anti-union, the hired anti-union consultants who came in at, for a lot of money, a lot of money, and um, were just hammered people with anti-union anti slogans and fear and Miss so confusion. Not true. Yeah, yeah, right. It was a fierce and really smart uh, campaign to defeat the union. They did things like, you know, the, the name of their company was Labor Relations Institute, which is a similar name to the National Labor, Labor Relations, Relations Board. Board. Right. And we, you know, we would talk to folks right. in the factory who were smart, very smart folks, but the lines were blurry. Was Labor Relations Institute like a neutral party? Was it related to the National Rela Labor, Labor Relations, Relations Board? Board? Yeah. They handed out copies of the of the National Labor Relations Act, which is kind of strange. But they they would say things like, "We want you to have the facts," and so it they 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 could almost seem like a government agency trying to give the pros and cons of being in a union, when in fact it was a very smart. Uh, campaign built on a playbook decades in the making oh, yeah. for how to sow confusion in the minds of workers and, and so fear that you'll, you know, you're, you'll get less wages, you'll lose your job, the plant will close, all kinds of stuff. Oh, really? I see somebody use LR, LRI here. You know, we always talk about this because we didn't even quite realize that almost any union drive you're going to see, like what you don't see are these consultants who operate really in the shadows but very powerfully at the workplace yeah. in in any kind of company you see that and most people in america have no clue about this and this also comes up in nine to five i mean the beginning of all this is the late 70s early 80s around the early reagan days and the you know when th this kind of playbook that steve refers to started being perfected and and there's, there's uh, over 100 such companies that get hired by corporations all over the country 
anytime there's a union effort, these companies, it's almost like a reflex. They'll hire uh, consultants to, to sort of dissuade or confuse the workers so that the campaign can't get very far. Yeah. It's, it's very one-sided. It's closed door. It's, yeah, it's, it's really, so that was, that was very revelatory. It was also, making the film was fascinating to see the early days, all this goodwill between the Americans and the Chinese, blue collar workers. You know, there's a scene early on when Rob, one of the Americans, invites the Chinese folks over to his house for Thanksgiving. And, you know, he has Harley Davidson's and he, he has a lot of guns and they end up shooting guns in the backyard, which if you live in China, you don't get to do. And it's a great time. They all, they, you know, they had a great time. And that was emblematic of this sort of cultural curiosity, cross-cultural curiosity. But when the plant stopped, was not making a profit like everyone from China expected it to, all that goodwill and all that curiosity started evaporating. Fade, and, yeah. all, and the Chinese folks had more and more pressure put on them to get results from the Americans. And then they in turn put pressure on the Americans to produce more glass faster Speed and, up, speed up, yeah. And then all this feeling of disrespect and bad treatment, uh, the OSHA violations, the EPA violations, all that stuff started accelerating. And then you could sort of see this turn in the whole tone of the factory that it went from curiosity and goodwill to distrust and, and, uh, and, and rising animosity. And it was really hard, painful, but fascinating to see. Mm-hmm. So somebody asked, actually, it's Patty Zimmerman. Hi, hi Patricia. Uh, to say a little bit about the cinematography, which it, it does get commented on, actually. We, we actually, just so you know, Patty, we, there were some cinematographers who were campaigning for our film to get uh, nominated for cinematography, the Cinematography Award. But we had five cinematographers, and they don't allow that. You can't have any more than, like, two or something right yeah well, um, anyway it doesn't matter we, we no thank you for the question that's yeah. something we care about a lot that doesn't get raised a lot is how we film people we, you know our, our feeling is that blue collar folks industrial workers don't get portrayed with respect in the media a lot uh and we realized we want when we filmed these environments we wanted to use like a more slightly more telephoto lens like a more glamorous lens that you would film a movie star with as opposed to a wide angle lens, like many of us are on right now, which, you know. Nobody it, looks good. Which, which, <laughs> which, which when, when you're filmed with a wide angle lens, like our noses yeah, are right, bigger. Yeah, right, there's Tony, right, yeah. And we just don't look as, I mean, for lack of a better word, as glamorous. Well, glamorous in our cultural terms, what we and, expect yeah. to see in the media, exactly. you know, you expect to see stars and certain, so we wanted people to look attractive, like look attractive, and, and yeah. There was so much beauty in that factory and in, in, in the faces of everybody working <coughs> be, because of its, its frankly diverse workforce, age, race wise, culture wise, but also uh, the lighting in the factory, because it's a glass Beautiful. factory, yeah. there's a lot of side lighting because people are inspecting glass. Mm -hmm. And that means you're holding up windshields bet and between you and um, this bank of light, your windshield is inspected, but that means you're lit from the side. Most of us, you know, we're, we're lit from the top under horrible fluorescent lights. But in this factory, it's dark, mm -hmm. except for these banks of lights doing side lighting like makeup mirrors or movie lights. I think, too, over, I think that's true. But also over the years, as we've worked, you know, to, to learn our craft, uh, we've learned about how to use daylight and just how to make, just where to position ourselves. Uh, I mean, we could say, well, we like the short side that I'd have to show you diagrams to know. What well, I mean, and we also try to film below eye level. Yeah. You know, when your camera lens is, is below, at, at or slightly below someone's eye level, it's, you're looking up at someone and it's more respectful. We try to tell all our camera people with whom we work, don't ever film someone when you're looking down, down at them. Down at them, yeah. Because it's, it's not as respectful and you're not on the inside of whatever they're experiencing. You're on the outside looking down and looking in as opposed to in, in it and looking up as a part of it. Uh, so that I was another to, principle. I have to bring up our editor, who was, who was a fantastic editor, Lindsay Utes, who we had never worked, we had never had an editor before. So this was like a big deal to us to hire an outside editor, and she was really good. But 
she was also like the bad shot cop. <laughs> she would not allow uh, any bad shots. Yeah. And I have to give her a lot of credit for that because we would, we might tend to use a few that were not so good for the content of the, sh of the scene or whatever, but. No. She was fierce about that, but we're grateful because she really was big rigorous. And when you have 1200 hours of footage, you know, we had plenty of material. Yeah. So she, her standards of like only good, well-framed, well-focused images uh, as, a, as a, a rule, that, that was okay because we had enough. Yes, footage. we did watch Gung Ho. We watched it again. You know, we watched it again in the early days of making this film. And I was shocked how racist it is yeah. and what a bad movie it is. We're talking about the 1986 uh, Hollywood feature by, directed by Ron Howard called Gung Ho about a Japanese company that buys a, a closed up American auto plant and reopens it. And it's also about the cultural intersections of, of Asian and blue collar American uh, auto workers. But it, it's not a good movie. And it's it just got so many horrible racist stereotypes of Asian people. So that was instructive. I mean, we have to say, as two white, Midwestern, middle-aged, middle-class, middle-everything uh, filmmakers, we were worried and we tried to address our blinders and our limitations as filmmakers in making this film because we, were, we realized we, we had to try to tell the Chinese story as well as the American story. And finding and then working with, hiring, developing relationships with, and great trust with the two co-producers, Yichen Zhang and Mi Jia Li, who came on board this film in 2016 and were crucial to the film becoming what it is. Uh, that was an essential, essential part of making the film. They were so great. In fact, this table we're sitting around right now, we, you know, they would come to, you know, to, to Dayton, they would fly in from wherever they were and stay at our house and sleep upstairs. And we would sit around this table, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for sometimes a week or more at a time, repeatedly. Uh, and we really got to sit and ask them, you know, they're born and raised in China. They had only recently even come to the US. They were both bilingual, but they were, we were able to ask all about like, like education in China and daily life. And these people in the factory, like, did they go to high school? What, what kind of training did they have? What kind of, were they just from what would you consider a small town? What, would, what were their parents like? What were their grandparents like? What were their, you know, they helped us understand how China is so excited to be on this incredible economic rise. And everybody is pulling together for that in general. I mean, there's plenty of dissension too. And it's almost like, and you know, Tony knows this better than we do is like, so my dad, like looking back on the last 50 years of China, China and the last 50 years of America, right? Very different trajectories. So my dad was a union man. I'm from a working class background. And Dayton is a very blue collar kind of place. The workers today look back and they, they say, well, gee, my grandpa had it better than I did. My dad had it better than I did, especially white workers, but a lot of black workers too. Um, you know, and now we're, you know, we barely make a living wage at all. There are hardly any union jobs left. You know, the neighborhoods have fallen apart. The school systems have fallen apart. All the swimming pools have clothes that we all used to play in. On and on and on and on. Our, w there's a feeling here that our, and probably there too, I don't know, that our economic system, our culture is in decline. So Chinese young people who are workers in that factory look back and they say, well, my grandpa lived in rural poverty. You know, the family barely survived. My dad also, you know, and I was able to like somehow get to the city and get a job. And now I have an apartment and I maybe can have a car eventually. So their very, their trajectory is the opposite of ours, yeah. culturally and sort of emotionally within the people. And we were trying to make the film not be rooted in a Midwestern point of view of anxiety about China. You know, it's so easy for us to have a reflex about like, well, China's taking over everything. But we, we hoped in structuring the film and choosing which quote unquote characters we would follow that we could engender empathy for the Chinese point of view, particularly through the character of Wang He. He's the guy who talks about coming to the States, missing his two kids, missing his wife, to admitting that he cried for the first time uh, because it's so far, he's so far from home. And then he talks about 
his life. We follow him um, talking about and having empathy for the Americans, the blue collar <laughs> Americans. And, and it's, 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 it was hard structuring the film in that way, but we, we worked as best we could to say like, this is not just from an American point of view, uh, even though we are limited by our point of view. You know. I know we, we had a lot going on here, but somebody asked a question which really worried us too. Does this film contribute to the racist China bashing in America? You know, it could. Yeah. I have to say it could, definitely. Yeah. I don't agree though. I think that, that we, you, you get a real feel for the character of Wang, who he's talking about, who misses his children. We had much more of him. Like we had, we actually got to know his wife in China and met his boys, uh, but it didn't fit into the movie. Um, yes, it, it definitely could. I, I feel as though we in equal measure make fun of the Americans work, the American workers and the Chinese folks. You know, there's equal amount of, of playfulness and, and um, well, irreverence, maybe. Irreverence, okay, yeah, toward, toward both. But yeah, I think if you go into the film thinking, um, Joe Barry says no. Uh, if, you think, if you go into the film with an anti-Chinese bias, it, there is that danger, there is that and we're, danger, and we're yeah. aware of that. Yeah. We, we, you know, yeah. Well, this actually is a good segue to uh, yeah. Dr. Lewis Picard, who uh, we've invited from the University of Pittsburgh. Yeah. He's the director of uh, public administration, and we asked him to explore that idea of Chinese globalization and its impact on uh, not only the United States, but uh, Dr. Picard is an expert in African investment by China as well. And maybe, uh, uh, Lou, this would be a good time for you to uh, comment about uh, your, your understanding of what uh, some of the objectives of the Chinese government in terms of uh, global investment. Yeah, well, thank you, thank you very much, and I'm I'm delighted to be here and uh, honored to be here with the uh, uh, with the filmmakers. It's it's an absolute uh, fascinating discussion so far, and I do do want to step back and talk a little bit more about the uh, sort of political economy of what I saw going on. I've seen the film twice. We saw it again a couple couple of days ago. Uh, the, my first reaction when I saw the film the first time was took me back to a wonderful film that I think is underappreciated called One, Two, Three uh, by Billy Wilder and starring uh, James Cagney, which is about the coca colaization of Europe, basically, or of the world. Uh, and it was uh, made 1951, so the Cold War had not really sprung fully out. Uh, and it reminds us, I think, that, you know, this has been a, a long trip of the so-called American century, and I think of, you know, the invasion of uh, Latin America by Ford, uh, the so-called soft culture of the 18, uh, 1980s and 1990s, when, as you point out, uh, Americans saw themselves in the, uh, in the ascendancy. And, uh, uh, and, and it reminds us that this is a, this is a, a, a long story. Uh, globalization is relatively new, 1970s, 1980s, uh, but globalization really means the globalization of the rest of the world on Europe and North America, because prior to that, globalization meant Europe, the United States, North America uh, expanding out, and in particular in the American century, uh, the U.S. expansion uh, all over the world economically. Um, I, I think I'd like to just raise about five or six themes that I, I see coming through and, and, and I think it's, it's important that we do see two sets of cultures, two sets of value systems uh, operating here, engaging or disengaging, not engaging perhaps. Uh, one of course is the, is the one that we, uh, we know well, which is the American value system, which is perhaps a mythology rather than a reality, but uh, uh, the, the, the theme is individualism and uh, the idea that uh, trade unions should be operating collectively, but they should be operating for the workers themselves, not in, in, not in a, a lockstep with management or a lockstep controlled by the state uh, in any way. The other system, of course, is the system which is sometimes labeled as corporate. It can be socially corporate in some places, militarily. Uh, and, and, and corporatism, 
essentially shows a strong relationship between uh, the ownership, the state, which is how China's evolved now, uh, an intimate relationship, and the third branch, which is of course the working group, which essentially is linked in a corporate structure, not in an oppositional or a challenging structure, but operating uh, in conjunction with or in coordination with, uh, with the state and with the private sector uh, that China now has. That corporate structure, it seems to me, is something that we need to understand as we, as we, as we think about uh, debates about uh, China. And I, I think it's important, and I, don't, I don't, did not see uh, China bashing in the film, but I do see different management styles uh, coming through. Uh, very important that, uh, that we not overestimate the culture because obviously behind all of this is is a value system is an economic system on both sides uh, which is interacting and at least in this case this is Chinese money which is coming in and, and there's a difference between different forms of economic penetration one is what I call horizontal that is it goes across the top it's based upon money uh, being reinvested or invested overseas uh, with some perhaps management control, but not a, a social involvement. The other is what I call a vertical kind of expansion, where you not only transfer money horizontally, but you work in a management style which transfers over and goes top to bottom. It goes much more deeply into uh, the society. Uh, and in many parts of the world, when China goes in, it doesn't go in just with money. It goes in with foreign aid. It goes in with, uh, uh, with investment. It goes in with management, but it also goes in with smaller uh, sector involvement and uh, uh, very much of a small business presence uh, occurring. That hasn't occurred as much in developed countries as developing countries, but they, the, the, the system we're seeing here, it seems to me, is a vertical system in which you're going much further to the top, much further to the bottom, Clearly, the, 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 the trade union system there is tied into the Communist Party. It's tied into the leadership structure in China. And so that's, a, that's an interesting difference from a political economy perspective. It, it raises then the question of uh, the relationship between China and the world and, and uh, whether or not there is a way that those systems can be reconciled the vertical versus the horizontal. Uh, because the her vertical uh, penetration is not going to be favorable to a free uh, laboring, uh, a labor movement, a, a working class movement. Uh, it resembles in some ways the system which preceded it, which was a state owned command system. Uh, and very much uh, the, the state capitalism that China has is, is a command system, uh, but it's a command system which is very sensitive and, and very understanding of the monetary factors, perhaps less uh, sensitive to the, uh, what I would call the, the cultural factors as they go in. And, and this has been a problem uh, with China. Uh, the US is not the only place where you can find China bashing. You find it in Latin America, there's a lot of dissatisfaction. You find it in parts of Africa where I work, uh, where a number of countries of, uh, been very uh, concerned about the political and the uh, uh, economic involvement and uh, the loss of control that that, uh, that entails. Uh, and of course, the other issue is going to be now in, in uh, connection with the virus, um, the massive amounts of debt which are going to be and have been uh, accumulated in, in China against all other kinds of resources and how that's also going to be uh, going to be managed. Um, so I think uh, the the issue of the debate about working class and working class rights is one which is difficult to resolve given the form of globalization which which is occurring which essentially uh, the, uh, the, the structures that have stronger leadership at the top, more ability to make decisions 
are more likely going to be able to operationalize control uh, in their investments in different parts of the world. And I don't think it's an accident that uh, China today has gone back to an older, more centralized system. Uh, they were institutionalizing at the political level until the latest regime uh, came to power. Uh, and it's also not an accident that authoritarian regimes are coming into place in a number of European countries and parts of Latin America. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, <clears throat> dare I say it, uh, in this country perhaps as well. Um, so I think the, uh, uh, the takeaway that I have here is the, in a way, uh, the irreconciliation uh, uh, between these systems uh, and where that's likely to go. I think I'll stop, uh, stop here and uh, uh, let you uh, carry on. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Picard, and um, and uh, you know if if the any of the audience members have any questions directed uh, to Dr. Picard, you can put them up in the chat or send them to Nathan Ruggles. Either way, and uh, we'll try to get to them in the last uh, twenty minutes or so of our program to to do our Q and A program. But next we have uh, you know uh, uh, our famous. Uh, a uh, filmmaker here from Pittsburgh, uh, Braddock, Pennsylvania, Tony Buba, who, who has a specialty. A specialty is making us laugh, for t <laughs> not only uh, not only in films, but personally. And he even here in the chat room, he's made me chuckle a couple of times. And uh, and he's an award-winning uh, filmmaker, an excellent filmmaker. And I know that he has a long, rich history uh, uh, with uh, Julia and uh, Tony. Tell us about your perspective on the film and uh, what you might want to say in terms of uh, the messaging and, and uh, thanks for being here. Okay, yeah. Yeah, one of the big problems, of course, I'm trying to get the, the glare out of my glasses, which every filmmaker hates when they're shooting someone with glasses on. Uh, I'll take it. So, uh, yeah, one is that, um, yeah, I first met, I mean, Julia's been an inspiration, even though I, I'm a few years older than Julia, I got started a little later. And uh, I think I first met Julia back in 1972 in Athens, Ohio, with uh, Growing Up Female. <laughs> she was uh, at the festival, and I think that was the first time I, I met her. So Julia and, and Apple Shop has been a, a you know, really big influence on what I'm doing. But also, what the films they make are, are really... With Patricia Zimmerman, who's online here, I mean, they put a series together on uh, my notes here, uh, a Wages of Work. And it's called, We Tell 50 Years of Participatory Media. And, and this is really what Julia has been doing, I mean, and, and Steve in her whole career. And in, um, in, in this series that they put together, which I was trying to get screened in Pittsburgh before the coronavirus broke out, there's a great film in Wages of Work which is called Finally, Finally Got the News. And it's a documentary of the revolutionary union movement, black union workers in New York. And it was called Drum, uh, Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement. And in that film too, like Julia, some incredible footage of inside the factory, which they, like, I think uh, Steve and Julia gave cameras to workers to get in when they were making the uh, Dodge truck. I mean, they must've just brought in 16 millimeter cameras and shot amazing footage. But what they were talking about, and this is 1970, forced overtime, speed up on the assembly line, unsafe working conditions. You know, now we flash forward and it's, it, it, it's the same issues. And so I just think it's uh, incredible. And the film itself, which is, you know, I, was, you know, I searched out reviews when it first came out and I think one review that really hit it on the head was from the strangest place was the Hollywood Reporter. And the review said, the film, and I thought it nailed it, the underlying message throughout the documentary is that the American dream has failed. It failed in Dayton when General Motors left. It failed in Pittsburgh with the steelworks. It's failed in Lordstown. And what is left is a false hope. You know, there with the, the company that comes in for Pittsburgh with the high tech or with gig workers. And you really think the only hope is unions and unions that really understand 
fighting across the board for the union workers, non-union workers, and, and for the communities. And I think that's really, you know, what the message of the film is, is that this is strength that you, you know, this we need unions more than ever, but not unions that are strictly for the advancement of that one particular trade and their salaries. I mean, it has to go beyond and beyond. Really, what the, uh, to me the message of the film is. Yeah, I mean, I, that's so right, Tony. That, that's something that really came up for me, both with Nine to Five and certainly American Factory. Um, and, the, you know, and I've also, you know, on taking American Factory on the road, I got to work with the AFL CIO, um, I got to work with the UAW. Um, I got to work with also things like J.P. Morgan uh, and these sort of cap enlightened capitalists, right? And owners of sort of enlightened businesses, right? And um, gosh, I could go and say, I could say so many things about this, but something I feel really, and we're all an old group here pretty much, but we got to get out of the way. I mean, there's got to be younger leadership in the union movement. People have got to give up. The old timers have got to get out of the way, and we have to really work to strengthen. The union. I mean, you brought that up. It's, it's, it's what's going on in Pittsburgh right now, and actually, in Pittsburgh with the uh, with with candidates running within the Democratic Party of uh, of the old timers not wanting to get out of the way. We had some really dynamic young women who are okay. much more progressive than that even uh, these people were in their prime, you know, and, but they just refused to sit down and fight every moment of it. And it, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's very tough to do. The other thing I was uh, thinking about is the whole idea of, uh, is somebody talking about the workers and, you know, you look at the film and thinking, American workers, they expect the safety, they expect that. It's, it's not what they expect. I mean, this is, it's from just being where we are. This is what they fought for for over 100 years to even get to that spot. I mean, it's not something that is provided by American exceptionalism. I mean, these people fought day in, day out. And, they know, you know, and doing this with the Battle of Homestead is really, uh, you know, just it brings it out. I mean, this is, workers weren't given anything in the United States. They just fought every step of the way to every little piece of crumb they ever got. And they're still fighting. And this is... Yeah. It, it's true, and you're right. Kind of, you know, one of the things we wish we would have organically been able to film is the sort of the labor movement in China that is really quite active, quite widespread. We studied it a lot. We read, you know, we, we would go to China Labor Bulletin, which is a news site, website that documents Chinese labor activity. We read the books like China on Strike and our, some of our advisors are, are very versed in the labor movement in China. Unfortunately, and this is a choice we made that you should feel free to criticize us for, we decided that because it didn't happen at our factory at Fuyao in China or Fuyao, I mean, you know, Fuyao in America it happened, but we didn't see Chinese activists fighting for the union in the States. At all, no. We, we didn't feel like we could put title cards up on screen that say like, there is a, hey, there's a labor movement in China. This is something we grappled with, you know, as filmmakers. The, the film is verite driven, but that limits you to including material that you, you filmed as opposed to getting news footage or, or what have you. And, that, and, and that's something we're, we, we've been conflicted about because we want to highlight the fact that there's militant labor movement going on in China right now. It's really hard to read about, but it's, it's there. It gets repressed a lot, too. It really does. But what Tony also, so that's true, but what Tony's saying, is the reason we make these history like nine to five or like what you, why you've made a lot of your films and why it's important that people have know something about how did the world change? How did we change society for the benefit of the average person? It happened through struggle. It was not given to us. And most people, people need to realize that. Uh, younger people need to realize that. And I think the labor movement, again, has to be peopled with younger, more militant um, people from the bottom up, smart people uh, who are willing to be, to take risks and be militant. I mean, look, look what happened with the teachers. Yeah. 
you know, they, they, did, they even went, some of them, against their own union because they knew what they needed. They were, you know, militant. So well, we I, were, I, I have great hopes for the labor movement actually right now. Compared to yeah. 10 years ago, when we filmed the General Motors factory right. closing right. In, here in Dayton, Ohio, we kept asking ourselves- There was no fight back at all. Where's the militants? Where, where are these, the, 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 this is sad to say, I'm not happy to say it at all, but the workforce that we got to know, which was dozens and dozens of people, they relied on their union to- The leader, the leadership. The leadership of their union to sort of save the plant. And it was a very kind of passive engagement. They said, well, look, if the plant's gonna be saved, it's, it, there was no sort of like, it's on us. We gotta to get to the streets. We gotta block the entrance to the factory. We gotta to go to Detroit. Uh, four plants closed, four GM factories closed on December 23rd, 2008. That one of them was the one we were filming, but the, of the four, the only one where they had labor militancy was the one in Canada. Uh, and that was, you know, that was notable to us that these, these unionized workers didn't seem to have that militance that, and that their four mothers and four and that fathers. that says something had. about the, you know, and Rosemary is, is familiar, obviously, as a union leader, and I don't know how you would feel about this, but it says something about the relationship that people have to their union. Like, what does the union expect of people? What is the union for, in their view? Sometimes you talk to people and they say they're in a union, and you say, well, which union? And they go, well, I don't know. I guess it's the AFL-CIO. Now, I, I don't want to- They don't now, even know what union they're in. Uh, uh, now, <laughs> it's easy for us as sort of privileged you yeah. know, people to, to complain about this. I want to remind us all that working in a factory is insanely hard on your body. And it, you leave that shift at, at four o'clock or whatever, and you're spent and you need to rest. And the idea of then going to a union hall to, to organize or do activities is really damn hard. Uh, and so I, I want to yeah. copy out what I just said by, by, by saying that. But we can't let labor just be sidelined. You know, something came up again and again. I don't know if it came up at the Pittsburgh event you guys had. Um, but the, the thought about what's the future of work, right? We have automation coming, we have AI coming, what's the future of work? And we were at many discussions on a high level of this with the film. I mean, at like things like JP Morgan Chase at these- The Atlantic big, Magazine. The Atlantic Magazine had several forums on the future of work, lots of things like that. And there were no union representatives there at all. Uh, and so we started demanding that if we're going to be on a panel or in an org in a event about the future of work, we would not present, we would not be present unless they had working class union speakers. Because the future of work, we have to insist, can't just be the, gov the, the, the corporations deciding on that yeah. with maybe some help from the government. It has to include at the table in, in a real way the voices of workers. And what are the voices of workers? We're talking about unions. And that cannot be seen as like a bad word. And we had to fight that a lot yeah. in some of these, these high up intellectual forums. We bring up unions and people would be like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if we should have unions there. You know, well, a lot it's of, still a lot true. Of, a lot of enlightened corporations want to grapple with the future of work and they want to make things better for workers and have workers have more of a voice, all these sort of euphemistic things. And we just would laugh and say, well, if you want to give workers a voice, be neutral when it comes to an organizing campaign. That's like the simplest way you can do it. Dr. Picard, you pointed out, you were talking about sort of the relationship between the Chinese state and Chinese industry, Chinese business. But it, it made me remember that during the union campaign at Fuyao, the state of Ohio and local representatives who were, who were democratically elected representatives, Republicans, spoke out against the union. They urged their constituents to vote against the union because it was gonna be terrible. And that happened in Tennessee when they were having the big uh, Volkswagen vote. Mm -hmm. uh, the governor and Senator Corker in Tennessee said, look, if, if you working people of this factory, if you vote for a union, it's going to be terrible for Tennessee and you, you know, imp implying you're going to lose your jobs and things will be bad. There's collusion with the state and the businesses, very similar, in my mind, very similar to what you see in China between the state yeah. and businesses there.
and that's that really goes back to right to work and the um, it's the model same model basically you you weaken the uh, the uh, alliance of uh, the unions and at the same time uh, you do you see a a, a comfort level in allowing the uh, the uh, in this case uh, Chinese investment coming in and creating a, a quiet from that perspective. Uh, as it seems to me that if you go to uh, some of the European countries that are also dealing with China, you're going to feel, find a stronger response uh, from their unions, particularly in countries where there is a is a history of uh, uh, vocal, uh, articulate, uh, uh, working of sets of values intersecting with the social democratic parties and the uh, parties of the left. Uh, now, the one thing I thought you were going to say, um, perhaps you were thinking, uh, that perhaps if there's a silver lining with the current administration in Washington, is it's, it's trying to break these comfort level institutions uh, between business uh, and, and the private sector uh, by going over their heads. And in some cases, that may ricochet back and, and create a strength in the unions that we haven't seen in the last uh, 15 or 20 years. Uh, there, there is a potential. Uh, there's also the possibility that it, it won't happen. I'm, I, I'm not going to put any money on it. But, but clearly, our institutions are now, if not broken, at least bended. And perhaps some of these institutions, these institutional relationships, could uh, jigger and rebalance the, uh, the uh, economic system, uh, particularly in uh, areas where the, uh, uh, the uh, international investment is, is involved. So unfortunately, that will come with, with uh, bashing, for, foreign bashing, as we know. Mm. Not just China bashing, but uh, all kinds of bashing of foreigners, both uh, Im immigrants as well as investors. All good points. Um, and uh, so this is the Q&A period, and uh, we have a question from w uh, Will and Nathan that we uh, would like to know that you were granted so much um, access to high levels of the Fuyao management and uh, their meeting rooms and their parties. And, yeah. and uh, the question is, is uh, you know, how and why did Fuyao agree to all of this? How did that happen? Right, I know. <laughs> we, well, we were... It was such a gift to us as filmmakers, and I think to the audience ultimately, that we were given that much access. It's very unusual. Uh, well, some, when, when the plant was, was gonna open, some of the city fathers who had helped bring the plant there, you know, through the state of Ohio, uh, had seen the last truck and they went to the chairman. They, they, they said, look, this is historic what you're doing here. And there are these two people who could, you know, are very good filmmakers or whatever, and they could make a film about it. Uh, and what do you think? And so he was willing to consider it. And they came to us and asked us if we would be interested in making a film following the fate of this endeavor. And we would be interested, but we had three, we said there were three conditions. One is we would take no money from the plant at all or anyone connected with it, which I think surprised them because they were prepared to like pay us to make the film. We said, not a penny, no. We said we would have to, we had, they would have no control over the editing. Editing would be up to us and we would have to have access. And that didn't mean that we got into every single meeting we wanted to. There were times when they would say, no, no, you know, especially as time went on, honestly. Um, but we had a huge amount of access. We could, we could go in and out of the plant anytime we wanted. We had no handlers after maybe a week. Uh, and we had passes, we had actually cars yeah, that would ID, swipe ID the doors. So yeah. we had all that. And so what happened then is the chairman, who I guess saw the last truck, I'm not sure, the chairman to his credit said yes. Uh, he's a quirky guy. He's, he's not your typical Chinese capitalist. He is not a member of the Communist Party. Uh, his, some of his family is, and he certainly knows how to use the levers of the Communist Party, um, but he's not a member. And we actually interviewed him like seven or eight times. We still are in communication with him. Um, he's, we, we really got to know him pretty well. I mean, I heard from him like last week. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say the secret is time and our, the fact that we live a short drive from that factory, 
we showed up hundreds and hundreds of times. Mm -hmm. And at some point, you know, everyone's self-conscious in the early days. Everyone's mindful of what they say and mindful that the camera's there. Mm -hmm. But we were there for three years. And by six months into filming, all that self-consciousness just naturally starts to melt away. We would say to people, look, don't perform, just be yourself. We'll be, we'll treat you fairly. We'll do our best to be fair, but we need you to be authentic, uh, you know, and do your, just do what you're doing. We, we try to convey to people that we will, we would, um, that they would, when they saw the film, like they they would see their voice. They would hear their themselves as they are. They may not agree with their point of view might clash with other points of view, but like everybody would be treated with respect uh, that, you know, and that was something we said, we tried to honor that in the edit room. Um, but, but really the key is showing up again and again and again, because we were told, no, you can't film this meeting. No, you can't film that meeting again and again and again, but through po polite, relentless asking and just trying to be a friendly person and trying to engage Sometimes you say, okay, come on and you can film this one. Or you, we'd say, let's just, can we just film the beginning and then they'd forget we were there, you know? That yeah, kind of I mean, it's, it's just a um, matter of just not, you know, you gotta just show up and do the work. Good for you. That, that's a wonderful story and thank you very much. And can you bring us up to date with what's happening at the plant now? I mean, are there still 2,200 American workers and 200 Chinese workers? Um, yeah, they've actually hired a few. Well, right now they've been closed, you know, and they're very slowly reopening. So uh, it's graduation night here, so there's tons of kids out honking their horns. Um, uh, uh, well, I'd have to go to before the pandemic, because I don't know what's, I mean, we've been in touch with some workers, people are starting to go back. Um, you know, are there temperature checks? Are there masks available? Some of it is mixed on that. Um, but yes, there was there were huge OSHA fines in the past year. Uh, like I forget the amount, but very huge OSHA fines again. Uh, a, a worker died. You might have read that in 2018. Was crushed under uh, huge panes of glass. And that accident, we got to know the guy who was the safety manager in the film, John John Crane. He's the guy with the heat gun with the heat gun. And he actually, we, we had a great scene of this, but we didn't use it. He actually quit uh, at one point after maybe a year because he just felt like he couldn't, he was asked to lie too much. So, but we kind of became friends of his. He came to Sundance on his own dime and we've been in touch with him since. He said the accident that killed that guy um, had happened five times, but the other people didn't get killed. So you don't have a coroner coming in. It's not in. They the got news. injured, but yeah. Yeah. And he showed us pictures and all that stuff. Uh, so what's happening in the plant? Um, a lot of people left. A lot of people got fired. Um, the turnover is still remarkably turnover's high. Turnover is still really high. I yeah. mean, there's two thousand people that work there, and there's over six thousand people who used to work there. Over six thousand former employees for a company that's like five years old in the area. It's remarkable. Most of those people were fired, but a lot of them quit. The plant is making a profit, uh, yep. not a big profit, but it's, it's, it's profitable. They're expanding, but they're not hiring more, but they are putting in more automation and more robots. And that's where you see that in the film, that the, the future is, as the chairman said in an interview, the future is gonna rely a lot on automation. Somebody yeah. mentioned, I think, actually it was uh, our professor, mentioned the different management styles, which I wish we could have gotten more into that in the film because it was fascinating, but um, boy, it's really loud. It's yeah, sorry, to, there's sirens and stuff. There's a parade. I, we, we live on the main street of our little town and there's a huge parade going on right over us. So we are cheering, it's because yeah, of that. Yeah, I mentioned, yeah. So sorry. Um, you're fine, thank you. There was, there was a, a, you know, the, the way in which people are used to being managed in China is very different than how we're used to being managed here, and even taught skills. Uh, the whole process of teaching people how to make glass um, was, Chinese folks are like, watch it being hap watch it happen, you know, and then the, the person who's teaching them walks away and says, okay, now you do it. <clears throat> we as Americans are used to like, here's step one, here's step two, 
here's step three, here's step four. That's sort of how our system works. But it's not like that over there. And management over there is much more of an authoritarian society. It has been for a long, long time. And so that it's, if a supervisor tells a Chinese worker to do it, they do it. But an American worker might very often say, well, why? Or I think I have a better idea. Um, Which is not to say that the Chinese worker is not thinking to themselves, why? Or I have a better idea. The one thing we didn't want to uh, reinforce was a stereotype of Chinese workers as automatons or robots, robots just doing their work. We felt plenty of spirit. It's just more a cultural thing of, of, of not um, questioning. You know? Yeah, it, it was actually hard to get sometimes the average line worker to even talk with us because we would say, hey, can I film you right now while you're working? And they say, oh, no, no, you should film my supervisor or you should film my manager. American workers wouldn't say that. You know, we're more individualists. We're like, oh yeah, I'm interesting. You can film me. <laughs> There's a few yeah. interviews in the film during the Chinese section where we talk to Chinese workers on the line and they talk about having to work long hours. They don't get to see their kids for months or years. They're, they're told you have to come in. And that was really important to us to include those voices because we wanted to try to convey that they, you know, whether you're Peruvian or Vietnamese or Chinese or American, if you work an assembly line, you have the same process of repetitive work and your mind flies. You grapple with the hopes of your life. You think about the people you love. You have your fears, you have your hopes. You have, all that stuff is a very human process when you're doing repetitive work. And we were trying, that's one reason why that scene's in the film is to try to convey that. And I also wanna say, I really appreciate what uh, Patricia Zimmerman said about multi-character films. We love multi-character mm -hmm. films, and that's the kind of film we strive to make, as opposed to the narratives that are one or two heroes who solve everything on their own. Change in the world happens because of collective action, not solo action. Yeah, and all the films, you think about yes. Seeing Red, multi-character, Lion in the House, multi-character, The Last Truck, multi-character, you know. We, we just... We like making that kind but it of is, But it's a yeah. really weird weave, you know, editing wise. You're always asking yourself, well, how much time can I spend with this one person or that one person before I have to go to like a big group scene or a big picture scene? And so, it, you know, you can look at the film. There's like the big picture scenes with rooms full of people. And then we zoom in on portraiture for this person or that person mm -hmm. or that person, but never, hopefully never too long. And then we go back to the larger story, like the, the grand opening uh, or, or other other big scenes like that. There were more out NLRB charges. They were they just lost, which I don't really understand. Be yeah, because well, like, there were ones that they the uh, wrongful terminations. You know. Well, they yeah, there were some wrongful ter wrongful terminations. Yeah, one of the supervisors just quit, and we were talking with him, and he said I can't. He said it was such bullshit that. Um, the, the NLRB charges for uh, violating people's rights to organize a union were dismissed by the NLRB. They didn't win. Well, it's a statute of limitations. Well, we don't, I don't know exactly we don't know what the full it was. Story, but, but we think it has to do with the fact that the, the stuff we filmed with uh, the company saying, we're going to fire these pro-union workers was That's filmed. illegal, right? It, it was right. filmed in 2017. And by the time the film came out, uh, you know, the statute of limitations on NLRB We charges. don't know if that's why the charges were brought. No, we don't know yeah, that for right. sure, but that's a strong potential reason. Yeah. What, are, what about racial diversity? Your uh, film rep you represented that there were quite a few African Americans and women oh, yeah. at the plant. Are they still recruiting? Uh, oh, yeah. It's still pretty diverse yeah. from what we've seen. We were, we were in the plant a year ago, uh, walking around with, um, you know, doing a tour uh, and it, it still seemed as diverse as, as, as that, but um, as it was. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of, uh, Dayton is a, a city that is, you know, almost 50% white, 50% black. We have a rising Latinx, uh, Latinx community. And there is some, uh, there, there's a growing population of, of Latinx folks who work at the factory, um, but it's, it's mostly African-American and white. Uh, and you see that in, in the plant. Uh, what you don't see is a lot of leadership. No, you don't. Uh, African-American leadership. No, yeah. As all. you can see in the film, the, the trip to China, it's all white guys, as you, as you can see, you know, even though there's plenty of people of color who work in that factory. Mm -hmm. 
And that's why in the film, Cynthia Harper, who's uh, the woman who wears the UAW t-shirt and then who's put on a heavy lifting line, she's lifting these huge windshields by herself. She's four foot 11 and she's doing a job that normally two men do. You lifting. can see that. I mean, uh, I, I she, it, and she know. says, this is why I support a union as a, as a black woman. It's the only way that we have a chance for things to be fair. You know, um, yeah, we catch a Chinese supervisor confessing to unfair labor. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand why that, why that failed. Our workers still starting it. They start at fourteen, <clears throat> as you see in the film. It hasn't been raised since all that time ago, and it was really raised up to fourteen from twelve because the union was was threatening them. I mean, it was very obvious. It was very obvious. It was literally within days of that big union meeting. Yeah. that that happened um, the management would say it had nothing to do with oh, that yeah, they we, told were, us we that. were planning oh, nothing, to nothing, give nothing. a raise no, anyway no, no. Yeah, and... which is such bullshit right yeah. uh let's see so they started 15 i will say to be honest that the, they top out at about 1950 uh on first shift and some people are making 1950 and i think even second or third is even a little more maybe like it like maybe they're making a little over 20 yeah. So they're, they're, it's still, that gets closer to a living wage, but people consider themselves really lucky to be earning that 1950 yeah. for that hard work at that, you know, at that place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 20, well, people went from almost $30 an hour down to $12 an hour. Right. And if you were on a later shift or if you worked overtime, it was over $30 an hour. Right. And that was, a, that's the kind of wages I'm assuming like my dad made with four kids uh, you know, we had vacations, we traveled, we, he bought a little trailer that we, we had a trailer at the shore. You know, we had like a, a life like that. It wasn't, we never worried that the lights were going to be turned off. You know, as a kid, we, we owned our car. We bought a new car every few years. We owned our home. That's what it was like to be a working class person then because so many people were in unions. Uh, and I, I you know, there's no economic reason we can't have that again. Oh, that's for sure. So yeah. Jackie Cavalier, is there a question for Tony Buba in the chat? Oh yeah, let's see. Yeah, there is a question from Patricia um, for Tony. It says, might you share what changes you have seen in the last 40 years in films about working class people and labor issues? What changes and what remains the same in these documentaries? Hmm. Tony, uh, do you want to try to respond or? Where's Tony? Tony, are you there? He's here uh, somewhere. Maybe here's Tony. Here he is. He's yeah. muted. Okay. Tony, you're muted. Tony, you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> okay, I found all day. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 I sent a private message to Steve. What ha what's going on with a lot of. Uh, documentaries is they they look for that emotional narrative arc which just drives me insane uh it, it, it's like the one person that has this you know cathartic experience and, and they they focus on oops he froze and you don't see that many labor films and film festivals even though i'm sure a lot are made and so I don't know, I mean, Julia and Steve could probably talk about that better than, than, than I can. Uh, the, I mean, the issues remain the same, and I, but I, I haven't seen that many. I really haven't seen a bunch of festivals. I still haven't seen a lot of festival programming stuff on, on, on labor and on, on a new movement going on, unless it's in... in a third world country, but nothing in the United States. I mean, almost as like with narrative films, they'll bring over, uh, you know, uh, a Loach film, but try to get a narrative film made in the United States about a working class issue and working class people see how difficult that is to get funding. I mean, it's, uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah, so, I mean, I'm not a, a sort of a vague answer, but maybe Steve and uh, Julia can address it better. Yep. You know, I think we're, our film's going to be on PBS, and so we're, we, we talk to IPBS now and then. And they mentioned that there were several films coming out in the next year that were that dealt with unionizing and unions. I just wonder, you know, with all the new workers who are getting activated and who are realizing how they're getting screwed, um, uh, 
if you know that's coming to the fore more now in a bigger way than just union workers are like these old time factory workers, right? Which is maybe more the stereotype. I know what you mean, uh, Tony, about that you don't want to find, I mean, I think our film leaves you very unsettled. Uh, I don't think it leaves you emotionally resolved about anything, either on the sad or the, like there's some, it leaves you very, very questioning and unsettled. And even seeing red gives, there's a sort of an emotional arc to that, but the last truck has, I, I don't think- I an emotional arc in terms like of like one individual. Somebody triumphing, you know, or just being totally beaten down. Well, you know, our film, The Last Truck, a 40 minute film is a very sad film. And we, you know, we live right next to Antioch College. I'll never forget this. We showed the film at Antioch and we were rightfully criticized by these Antioch students for saying, where's my um, call to action at the end? You know, right. it, it, it's like the film shows this demise of this middle class, blue collar middle class, dignity under assault. And yet, there's no sort of moment at the end where you're saying, here's what we can do. Here's the barricade we charge. And, you know, it's, a, it's something we grapple with all the time as filmmakers. It's yeah, like, I, do the, film, I, 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 do the films I, leave you with that or, or not? Yeah, I have the same problem with some of my films. Especially years ago, when I made Voices from a Steel Town, you know, where was the call to action? But the call to action was not, I mean, I'd have been dishonest to the material that there's a certain obligation to the material you have in and, and there was no because people weren't calling for it i couldn't put what i wanted into it right. just right. just for the film i mean this and this is the problem i have with a lot of michael moore's films i mean this whole sort of structure that goes on that people love the films when you know when it's their political point of view but his latest piece which has all the all the problems that are in all the rest of his films people dislike it i mean it's uh uh, you know that kind of voice that they put into it, but yeah, I mean you can't be dishonest to the material, and this is what has made your career so great. You've never been dishonest to the material, and that's what you have to do. I mean, I don't, I don't see any way around that. So What's another that? another point that you uh, made at the end of the film was that 375 million people were. It, it's anticipated their jobs will be eliminated by the year uh, in the next 10 years by 2030. And then now, uh, just this last week, I read where there's an ILO, an International Labor Organization report, saying that as a result of this global pandemic, another 190 million, or 95, 195 million uh, full-time jobs are expected to be permanently eliminated. And uh, so what is, you know, what is the future of work and are you anticipating a sequel to the film to address these issues? I mean, the issue of uh, what is the future of work for young people and how people obtain uh, sufficient earnings or income or uh, yeah. monetary uh, grants to be able to live on? No, it's a, it's a real question. I think I think it's going to take younger filmmakers to make those films. Don't you think, Tony? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I, I, I will say uh, one thing we learned over the last couple of years is technological disruption in itself shouldn't be feared, you know, because people freaked out when like the typewriter was invented and all, all kinds of stuff. It's more a political question than a technological question. We can find... There's, I think human beings have this innate desire to have meaning in their life by what they do and how we, how we spend our time, right? We, we, we find identity and meaning and dignity from how we spend our in time. Our work, yes. In our work, yeah. And there's plenty of stuff we can all do to make the world a better place. The world's in dire shape in so many ways. But it's, and machines and computer stuff can help. But it's, it's the political side of things. It's the fact that the the gaping income inequality is is protected by the, the politicians who are paid off to protect that huge income inequality. That's how they get elected. And, and I, I just want to say something about younger filmmakers. I mean, okay. we got lucky. You know, Julie had joined, uh, like uh, uh, Julie had New Day Films. They started that organization. We're 
actually, if you made a film, you can make money in distribution. For these younger filmmakers, I don't know how they can make money in distribution. I mean, I don't, it seems like it's so much tougher. Years ago, you can make a 20 minute piece and actually generate income from it. And now people are expecting that to be up on YouTube for free. And it's, uh, and so I, I do have a tough time with, with, in terms of younger person, how their career is developing and, and to keep them going, especially young filmmakers who are social or active and want to do political work. Uh, we have to somewhat support them. Yeah. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, Julian, Steve, and uh, Dr. Picard and Tony. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to John Haird for our closing remarks. But I want to thank all of our guests and uh, those who uh, were part of this program. I, I think it's been a fabulous uh, conversation. And we've raised more issues to uh, to uh, examine and find, uh, you know, hopefully Tony and or uh, Steve or Julia, you'll uh, be able to address those. Uh, John, would you like to close us out here this evening? Never pass up an opportunity, Rosemary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Julia and Steve, and I can't tell you how much it's uh, wonderful to see and hear you and to reconnect, to talk about the things that, um, Really, we talked about 40 years ago uh, and are still talking about. Um, Tony and, and Lou, you really helped, I think, to, um, to uh, uh, help the it, discussion uh, on a number of different issues. I found it fascinating, and I hope our participants did too. And I, uh, this is a wonderful way for us to kick off our series. I, I, I really want to congratulate our committees, our, our program committee that uh, funded and produced this program, uh, headed by Suzanne Donsky, our communications committee that helped to monitor and publicize this event, headed by Larry McCullough, and all the members of the committee that have helped to make, helped to make it work. Uh, Jackie uh, uh, Cavalier, our, our Zoom uh, commando, is fantastic. Uh, helping out, and Jerry on our website um, is creating wonderful information and links for that I hope uh, people who saw it tonight will follow up and go to our website. Um, we can put it up again uh, on the chat before we leave, uh, but uh, you can find out about our next uh, events. Next one will be uh, actually on June the 14th, a Sunday, and it's gonna be about coal miners and uh, about an author of, of uh, coal miners uh, who couldn't vote because they were working in the 1920s and 30s. Mm -hmm. And um, I do want to uh, remind folks that uh, your contributions will help us to make more programs like this. And please follow the link that we've provided on the chat line. Um, and uh, once again, thanks to everybody and see you again. And I can't tell you how, how um, important I think uh, what was said and what was communicated is tonight to all of us. So thanks again and uh, stay in solidarity folks uh, and stay safe everybody. And thank you very much. It's an honor to be here, thank you.